Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined by no one, actually, <laughs> here alone. People will be joining as the, as the time winds. I didn't want to, in the interest of time, I wanted to start the hearing. Today we'll hear testimony from the Department of Buildings, the New York City Fire Department, uh, members of the real estate industry, business owners, and others interested in, and interested members of the public on four bills. First, intro number 465, sponsored by Council Member Danny Drum, would require the Department of Buildings to conduct education and outreach regarding the requirements for single occupant bathrooms. Second, intro 644, sponsored by Council Member Eugene, would require carbon monoxide detectors in all business and mercantile spaces in the city. Third, intro 728, sponsored by Council Member Espinal, would establish a temporary program to resolve awning violations and require the Department of Buildings in consultation with the Department of Small Business Services to develop an education campaign for business owners regarding awning rules and violations. Finally, we'll also hear testimony on intro number 836, which I sponsored, which would consolidate the filing, review, and approval process for certain fire systems, emergency alarm systems, and fire protection plans under the fire department. This would eliminate the need for building owners to file separately with the Department of Buildings, saving time and money without com compromising public safety. Although Department of Buildings would no longer have to approve the plans, no work on fire suppression and fire alarm systems could be performed without approval from FDNY. Any other permits required for construction on alternation, on alternation work would still have to be obtained from DOB, and FDNY would enforce the construction code requirements applicable to permittees such as asbestos, zoning, and landmark requirements that are currently enforced by the Department of Buildings. This bill will reduce the burden on building owners without eliminating vital city oversight. I'd like to remind everyone who'd like to testify today to fill out a card with the sergeant, and we'll be sticking to a two-minute clock for all testimony. And now I'd like to uh, have the administration uh, affirmed. Can you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer, respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yes, thanks. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Rachel Van Tosh, and I am a Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I am pleased to join the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department to briefly testify on the impact of Intro 836 on businesses. Small businesses in New York City are an essential part of our communities, and SBS helps them to start, operate, and grow. One way we're doing this is by reducing the regulatory burden on small businesses. In 2015, following extensive outreach to the business community, Mayor de Blasio announced Small Business First, an interagency initiative to improve the regulatory environment. The goals of the initiative were to provide clear information with coordinated services, help business owners understand and comply with regulations, ensure equal access to services, and reduce the burden imposed by complex regulations and fines. With support from DOB and FDNY, Intro 836 will bring us one step closer to fulfilling those goals. This bill seeks to simplify processes between DOB and FDNY to save business <laughs> owners time, money, and hassle. It would streamline the filing, review, and approval processes for fire suppression systems, fire alarm systems, and fire protection plans under FDNY. This eliminates the requirement to file with DOB and, give F and gives FDNY responsibility over plan review and approval. These process changes would reduce the cost and administrative burden on businesses without compromising public health and safety. Applicants, the majority of which are businesses, will save an estimated total of $11 million per year and approximately one and a half months in process time. SBS is fully supportive of this legislation and we thank Chair Carnegie for sponsoring it. Thank you and I'm happy to take any questions following um, subsequent testimony along with my colleagues from DOB and FDNY. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I am Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here to offer testimony on three of the bills before the committee today, introductory numbers 465, 644, 
and 728. Introductory number 465 would require that the department conduct education and outreach regarding the single occupant toilet room requirements in the New York City Plumbing Code. Specifically, the bill would require the department to create materials concerning this requirement, including examples of acceptable signage. Such materials must be made available in the languages most commonly spoken by limited English proficient individuals and must be linguistically and culturally competent. The department is also tasked with reporting on the efficacy of its education and outreach annually. Following the enactment of Local Law 79 of 2016, the Plumbing Code requires that all single occupant toilet rooms be made available for use by persons of any gender and that they be labeled as such. This requirement improved restroom access for all New Yorkers, regardless of their gender identity. Information pertaining to this requirement is currently available on the city's website, and New Yorkers have the ability to file complaints with 311. When new requirements like these are added to the construction codes, the department conducts outreach to the construction industry, including through our building news electronic newsletter and service updates. The city's Commission on Human Rights also has a campaign dedicated to restroom use and gender identity. Given that information on the law and restroom access is readily available and the department has received very few complaints concerning it, the department does not believe specific outreach related to this requirement is necessary at this time. The department encourages New Yorkers to file complaints with the department if they find that the requirement is not being met or with the Commission on Human Rights if they are faced with discrimination. Introductory number 644 requires business and mercantile occupancies to install carbon monoxide detectors when such occupancies are equipped with a fire alarm system. This requirement would apply to the new construction of these occupancies and to certain alterations. When properly installed and working, carbon monoxide detectors can provide an early warning of the presence of carbon monoxide, allowing sufficient time for occupants to either escape or take appropriate action before the deadly gas can build up to dangerous levels. As such, the department supports requiring these detectors in more spaces as it, as it could improve safety. And we look forward to working with the council and other interested stakeholders on this issue. Finally, introductory number 728 requires the Department of Finance to create a program to allow for the resolution of certain signage violations. The program would last 180 days and allow respondents to cure violations within 60 days rather than face a penalty. The department would be tasked with publicizing the DOF program and developing a separate program to educate the business community about relevant signage regulations. Finally, this legislation would create an interagency task force to explore issues related to signage regulations in the city's building code and zoning resolution and issue a report to the mayor and speaker of the city council. Business signs and their installation must comply with requirements in the city's building code and zoning resolution. The regulations in the building code address permitted and structural issues, and the regulations in the zoning resolution address issues including surface area, projection, height, and illumination. These regulations exist to protect people from dangerous and illegally installed signs and to reduce visual clutter. Enforcement of signage regulations is entirely complaint-based. The department received 1,167 complaints in 2016 and 1,000 complaints in 2017. As a result of these complaints, the department conducted 883 inspections in 2016 and 837 inspections in 2017. These inspections result in the issuance of nearly 1,000 violations over that two-year period. The City Council passed a series of moratoriums on the imposition of penalties for signage violations in the early 2000s, the last of which ended in 2006. The City was also tasked with conducting outreach to businesses to educate them about signage regulations and about any amendments made to the, by the city to existing regulations as part of that effort. It is the department's understanding that the Department of City Planning submitted a report to the city council with recommendations for amending the zoning resolution and that such recommendations were not implemented. The program provided for in intro 728 to allow for the resolution of signage violations is problematic. The city is particularly concerned with the requirement that refunds be processed for violations that were correctly issued, as this is not commonplace nor appropriate. It should also be noted that the requirement, that as required by Local Law 45 of 2016, the Department of Finance already administered an amnesty program, which ended in 2016, and which allowed for the mitigation of penalties for many violations issued by a variety of city agencies, including signage violations issued by the Buildings Department. 
Running a comparable program for a subset of science violations would be a costly endeavor with potential limited response. Building off the report previously provided by the Department of City Planning, the department would welcome the opportunity to discuss science regulations further with the City Council and its partner agencies. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to testify before you today. I welcome any questions you may have. Is that it? Thank you. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Drum, Espinal, Gredenchik, and Rivera, and we'll have uh, opening statements on the bills, first by uh, Council Member Drum. Thank you very much, and thank you, Chair Cornegie, for hearing intro 465 and for your support for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. I was the chief sponsor of legislation. The council passed and the mayor signed requiring single occupancy restrooms be available to everyone regardless of gender identity. Local law 79 of 2016 ensures all single occupancy restrooms have a readily visible sign located near the entrance, noting availability for persons of all genders. Although that bill's passage was a crucial step toward lessening the risk of harassment or physical attacks on transgender and gender nonconforming people using restrooms, we are now facing a more practical implementation issue. Unfortunately, many bu buildings and business owners are either unaware of the law or are flouting the requirement with no seeming consequence. Last week, uh, two people from my office conducted a survey of restaurants and bars in my district and found that widespread noncompliance. Their findings show, and I have to say, everywhere I go, I don't see the signage change happening. I don't see it happening, you know, at all, really. Um, their findings show that no establishment had signage clearly designating its single room occupancy restrooms available for all sexes. Of the places with, single, with multiple single occupancy restrooms, nearly two thirds still exhibited uh, single sex signage. The remainder did not have such sex, sex segregated facilities, but also did not explicitly display all gender signage. Intro 465 will require the Department of Buildings to establish and implement an education and outreach program to increase awareness of Local Law 79 and an annual report on the implementation and efficacy of its efforts. Without proper education and enforcement, Local Law 79 is nothing but a symbolic gesture. Transgender and gender nonconforming New Yorkers need more than symbolism, they need action. Intro 465 is an easy and common sense way to show our support for New Yorkers of all gender identities and expressions. I thank my colleagues and the many human rights advocates who have worked on this issue. Together, we must ensure that transgender and gender nonconforming people are treated with the respect and dignity they deserve. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Councilmember Espinal. Thank you, Chair Cornegie, for having this hearing today. Intro number 728 is very near and dear to my community, and I'm happy to see many small business owners here to tell their story and give the testimony on this bill. For the past year, Dozens upon dozens of small businesses, especially along the Fulton Street Corridor in Cypress Hills, East New York, of my district, have received violations for the awnings on their storefront. To give some context, the DOB now requires a permit for business awnings. However, in 2005, the City of New York passed a moratorium which temporarily halted enforcement of building signage violations. Yet, with no warning or any information on how to comply with the law, once the moratorium ended, the DOB has issued violations to over 80 businesses in my community. These are businesses who for decades has, have had these signs without any complaints or fines from the city. Many merchants bought their location prior to the end of the moratorium with the existing signage in place and had never been told that they needed to register their awning with the DOB. And make no mistake, these fines are hefty and burdensome. As you will hear today, fines can range from $5,000 to $20,000. Imagine how this would affect a small business owner's bottom line. As we know, many small businesses are already struggling to stay afloat as they deal with rising rents and outside market pressures, including the threat of gentrification in neighborhoods like ours. What's even more troublesome is that the vast majority of these entrepreneurs are immigrant owners from vulnerable communities. Small businesses are the backbone of our society, as we all know. We should be supporting them and helping them thrive rather than pushing them to extinction over petty fines that are easily avoidable with the right education. That is why I'm so proud to sponsor intro number 728, which would take major steps to resolve awning judgments and, and get money back to those business owners who cure the violations. It would also institute a moratorium on penalties so more businesses that have more time to comply without getting fined and conduct education so these communities are clear on what is expected of them. Thank you again, Chair, and to all those who came to testify. 
Thank you, uh, Councilmember Espinal. We're going to move uh, to questions, but before I do, I just want to publicly uh, thank Danny Drum, the finance chair, for shepherding us through uh, the first budget under this speaker. I think you did a terrific job. Thank you. And with that, I'll let you ask the first round of questions. Very good, and thank you, uh, Mr. Whaley. I, I, I came in a little bit near the end of your testimony, but I do have some questions. What efforts has the DOB taken to inform establishments about the all gender signage requirements? Good morning, Councilmember Drum. Uh, so uh, with all um, changes that get made to the construction codes, we do provide general outreach to the industry. So we have what we call the building news, electronic newsletter, which goes out to many thousands of different types of uh, facets of the industry and people who interact regularly with the department where they were provided with notice. We also release what's called service updates related to changes to the law um, that provides outreach as well. Specific also to this requirement, um, the Commission on Human Rights did provide um, to perform outreach as well. Um, are all city owned or lease spaces complying with the signage requirements? How do you track it? We track our, we, we would track compliance based on complaints. So when we receive a complaint, obviously we would go out and perform an inspection. So when somebody goes out to a site and um, they see that the signage is not correct, that does not get reported back to you? They just leave it? No. So it, upon our receiving a complaint, the department would no, no, but it, on a general inspection, let's say. I'm sorry, I don't quite uh, Do you go out and do a general inspection or just... We don't, if your question is whether or not we perform proactive inspections right. on these signage violations. Not for the signage violations, but any other type of proactive inspections. Yes, we do perform proactive inspections, and as part of that inspection, we'll look for a number of indicia rela related to violations of the construction codes, yes. Do you look for the signage uh, violations? Uh, I think more often than not, when we're performing our inspections, they're oftentimes on construction sites, right? Um, there are times when we perform inspections based on a complaint that we receive from the department. That inspector does have the discretion to look for other, in, um, you know, violations of our codes. So it's something the inspector could check for, yes. Do they? Um, I can't tell you in every instance that they do. I can tell you that while they're out there performing their inspections, they are, per they are performing those observations generally. So how do you know if there's compliance with the law or not? I can tell you that there's been very few complaints received by the department as it relates to the compliance of the law. That mm. I can't tell you. How many transgender and gender non-conforming people work for the Department of Buildings? I don't have an answer for that question. I don't know. You don't collect data? Um, I don't have that da data with me. I can't say whether or not the department th collects that data, but I don't have that with me. You don't know if they do collect it or not? I honestly couldn't tell you, no. Well, how many um, transgender non-conforming individuals are in the DOB leadership? Uh, as far as I know, the answer is zero. Not good. What efforts is the DOB making to encourage diversity within its ranks? So as part of our hiring efforts, um, you know, we have now currently 1,600 employees within the department. We always have a need for hiring new plan examiners, new inspectors, and as part of our outreach for hiring, we ho hold many hiring pools throughout the city at a variety of locations. We do various types of outreach as well. So why is it that you don't know if they collect um, how many LGBT or uh, how, excuse me, how many transgender employees that you have, you, do you, that you don't know that if you collect that data or not? Honestly, I don't know if we keep track of that. We, perhaps we do. I certainly, if we do, I certainly don't have that information with me. But I'm more than happy to look into that and get back to you in the committee. Well, that does seem to be somewhat of a problem. Has DLB ever had a pride event? Uh, this month, actually, are, yes. When is that? I don't know the exact date offhand. Gee whiz, not, not much of a priority. When you come in for a hearing on this matter and you don't know the answers to these questions, what's one left to think? I could tell you that we were supportive of, uh, of the local law when it was enacted in 2016. And when we received complaints, we were responding Mr. Willie, accordingly. Just by your response though, it indicates to me that you're not taking the law seriously because you've not, not even made any, you know, any steps to have knowledge about who the transgender, gender nonconforming people are within the DLB. What type of a priority is it for you if you don't know the answer to these questions? Well, and then how can you be entrusted to implement the law? I think we are implementing the law. We supported the passage of the law. 
and we've implemented it. We've made changes to our code. We provide outreach to the industry. We provide services notices on the new requirement. And upon receiving complaints, we take appropriate action. It seems inspections. like a minimal amount of effort on your part to send out an email without any follow-up, without any inspections, without tracking, without any knowledge of who the transgender employees are, without knowledge of even when the pride celebration is going to happen. When you come to a hearing on a specific issue like this, one would expect that you would come prepared minimally to answer some of those questions. I'm here prepared to speak on the, the legislation itself, the introductory number. That's what I'm here to, to discuss. But if you don't know that other stuff, you can't speak about it, and that's the problem. That's, that's a huge problem within your agency. That needs to be corrected immediately. The, 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 the Human Rights Commission should be looking at your agency. That's what should be going on here. Anyway, um, how do spaces new and renovated that want to install multi-stall all gender bathrooms go about doing that? So as a part of the overall plan review process, when the applicant is submitting documentation to the department um, for its review, um, that documentation needs to make reference that they're going to be including the appropriate signage on the, uh, the, the bathroom that's being installed. Or for the, the multi-stall? Correct. For the, single for the single occupancy bathrooms that require the gender neutral signage, that information needs to be included in the plan submitted to the department. But for an, if, 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 an, if, if a building wants to have a multi-stall all gender bathroom, how do they go about doing that? You know what, uh, if I may, uh, Gus Sarakis is our Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs. Maybe he can join me here and he'll do, mm -hmm. better, do a better job answering that question. Gus, for the record, can you just identify yourself? Sure. Gus Sarakis, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development at the Department of Buildings. So I, I believe the process would still be the, the same as Patrick described uh, with regards to filing of plans, going through plan examination, and uh, obtaining a permit for the issuance of the, for the, for the work that's going to be performed. And I, I believe you're, you're trying to describe uh, all gender bathrooms with full height partitions for the, for the mm -hmm. stalls? Yes, that's. And what about the signage for that? Uh, that would also need to be included in the, uh, in the, uh, in the proposals? The plans, in the uh -huh. plans, yes. Okay. All right. Wait, Gus, I would just ask that you report back to this committee um, whether the, the right answer, because you, you, you don't know for sure. Okay, I, and I think you. I think, I, you I, think I, was, I was. The only reason I was. Uh, uh, a little, a little hesitant there was because I wanted to be sure I understood the question properly. I think the, the clarification of okay. uh, individual stalls with full height partitions and doors so that it's an individual occupant. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Espinel. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being so generous. Um, so back to my bill and when it comes to signage in front of the storefronts, um, you've mentioned in your testimony that they, that till 2016 DOF has had an amnesty program. Can you speak more to that? Yeah, not until 2016, 2016, but in 2016, a local law was adopted establishing a temporary amnesty per, um, period for all sorts of violations, including what would have been what signage violations as well. And what does that <laughs> what, what does the program do exactly? So for a period, I think it was a six month period as well. Um, not for the entire penalty associated with the violation, but penalties on top of that related to interest and default penalties. Um, if the violation was cured, um, those penalties could be waived. So not the base penalty, just the default if there was one and any interest associated with the penalty. So, so it allowed business owners to, to cure the violation without Correct. having to pay? Correct. Okay. I, I just find it very coincidental that after that amnesty program, which was in 2016, all of a sudden we have 1,000 complaints uh, regarding signage. And in 2017, a year after, you have over 800 inspections due to signage. Now, would, would, would the DOB agree that signage violations are probably not common knowledge to everyday New Yorker, or do you, do you think that's something that everyone knows that maybe a sign is not put up correctly? It, it, honestly, it's hard for me to say. I mean, if you're, if you're asking me if are there some s small businesses out there perhaps, who are unfamiliar with the requirements in the building code and the zoning resolution, I'd say it's certainly possible. I just, I just find it very odd that, um, you know, I think you testified also that a lot of the inspections were made because they were, they were complaint driven. I just find it very hard to believe that someone in East New York sat down and made 80 calls about 80 different businesses 
um, do, do, does the DOB have any information on where those calls are coming from, or is that all um, uh, concealed information? We don't. It's through 311, so it's anonymous. We don't know who's making the complaints, but what I can tell you is that all the inspections that were performed, um, not just in the Fulton Corridor, but throughout the city, are based on complaints received by the department through 311. So yeah, I think the issue is, is that here we have a situation where business owners, as I mentioned earlier, um, had no information on whether or not their signs were put up illegal or legal or not. They didn't know that there was a process to have those signs up, and they were blindsided when when the DOB came out and gave them violations from five thousand to twenty thousand dollars. I think it's no secret that any small business in my community that's that's run by mostly lower income entrepreneurs. Uh, that five thousand dollars could mean whether or not they keep their doors open. So there, there is some sort of conspiracy idea out there that this was probably driven by uh, an individual who wanted to take advantage of the market in the community. Um, so I know you mentioned that you think that refunding the community this funding, that the the, the the fines is problematic. But I think it's the only way we'll be able to pay back the people in my community so that they can have an opportunity to continue to uh, perform their businesses in the city. So I, I, I'm going to take it upon myself to continue pushing this bill as is because I think it's just the only way we can move forward. Understood. Um, you know, what I would say is that certainly all building owners have an obligation to ensure that their buildings are in compliance with the relevant laws, in this case the building code and the zoning resolution. That being said, um, I certainly get the concern and the department would be happy to work with you and the council on doing more targeted outreach, perhaps to specific communities, specific parts of the city, specific commercial corridors, to better acquaint them with the requirements of the law that they're obligated to um, live up to. Do you have any information on, on um, where, what, what, what parts of the city were these complaints being made beyond East New York? Um, I, can pr I can provide you with more detail. With me, I have information that's borough-based. So I don't have anything with me that targets, um, looks at specific parts of the city community board say perhaps, but if you'd like, I'd be happy to put that information together. And yeah, that, that'd be very helpful. You got it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Espinal. Um, I'm going to, before I go to more of my colleagues, I'm going to ask a few questions in line with what Councilman Espinal asked. I, I used to chair, as you well know, the Committee on Small Business, and um, there were times when there were fines and fees levied or assessed to businesses that we asked for a period or a time to cure. So they were given a warning. And in instances like this, it seems as though these businesses could have benefited from a warning plus a period of time to cure. I want to know if you're interested in going forward, especially in, in, um, in minority communities, and looking at that as a prescription as opposed to just uh, uh, this blanket, seemingly targeted enforcement. So what I can tell you is certainly the law doesn't allow for that per se. But what we can do is, you know, talk to you more about it and consider it. One thing that certainly would be helpful, as the as Councilman Espinal mentioned, is enhanced outreach. So if we can work together to find ways to target specific areas where there might be these problems today, or they might happen in the future, um, speak with them directly and inform them what the requirements of the law are, so they don't fall into the situation after the fact. Well, I know that this committee would certainly like to work with you in that to that vein. Uh, so that we could, uh, our small businesses are on tremendous, under tremendous pressure uh, right now all over the city and in particular in minority communities. And uh, we'd like to see the city be a partner and an ally in helping them to sustain their businesses as opposed to uh, what seems to be uh, taking place right now. Understood. We'd be happy to work with you on that. Okay, thank you. So uh, just a couple of questions about um, uh, Intro 728. Um, do you know or can you report to me how many awning violations did DOB issue in 2017? Yes. Uh, so in 2017, we received exactly 1,000 complaints. And based on those complaints, we issued uh, 582 violations. Um, you said that the information you had was borough-based. Uh, do you have those zip codes that are associated with those violations? So with me, I only have you know, a breakdown by borough. Um, but again, as I mentioned, the council member, I could um, refine that a little bit better for community board, certainly, and provide to the committee. So Brooklyn is, is a very big place, um, and I'd be interested to see, we actually, we could do a, a, a brief analysis just by the zip codes in Brooklyn as to whether or not uh, some communities that are of interest to members of this committee, and um, uh, so I, I'd like to get even the borough breakdown. 
Well, um, for, for, I do have the borough breakdown. So in Brooklyn, for example, in 2017, um, there were 346 complaints received, um, to which we issued 211 violations. And, and, and offline, I'd like to get those zip codes because I think that I, I'd, I'd hope that it wouldn't be a pattern that's demonstrated of targeted enforcement by looking at those zip codes. I won't try to do that here, but offline, I'd certainly like to and work, work with you to make sure. Yeah. And we'll, I'll be happy to provide a breakdown um, within the borough um, for Council Respinall and the committee. Okay. Is that, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you have another question, though. Uh, would DLB be able to give us the the amount of money that it collected from small businesses in the past two years due to sign signage violations? Yeah, I, I don't have that with me, but I'm happy to work with the Department of Finance um, to get that information and share it with the committee as well. Yeah, thank you. So I know you mentioned that outreach is something that you're very interested in going forward. Um, does DOB currently conduct any awning regulation awareness? Uh, currently, nothing specific. I mean, we do have conversations. Um, we've met with Council Member Espinal and members on, on the Fulton Corridor at, at least on one occasion. We do have what we call small business nights um, in each of our borough offices. So um, in Brooklyn, for example, um, Tuesday evenings from 4 o'clock to 7, 7 p.m., we open our doors and we allow small businesses to come in and ask us any questions that they like. It could be about signage regulation or anything else. And we have uh, experts on staff who are there to assist folks with any questions that they might have. I know this committee would like to um, partner with you to do some town halls, uh, maybe in partnership with our, with our bids. I know that my bid would, would benefit from a town hall uh, where, where um, its members could bring their concerns and or complaints directly to you in we'd, that same format. We'd welcome that opportunity. All right. Um, do I have any, any more questions, Colleen? I just wanted to follow up on the last thing. So the format that you're using for your four to seven open house, that takes place at your headquarters or where exactly? It's at each of our borough offices. And so you're, I just want to make sure that we have the commitment on record that you're willing to take something very much like this and bring it to districts in coordination with your agency. We certainly won't take four, three hours, but I think if you can do something in the evenings for the, the members of uh, the residents in our community, we would greatly appreciate it. Absolutely, we welcome the opportunity. Thank you. And I would just add on behalf of uh, SBS that this information is included online at NYC Business, so an explanation of the regulations are available in multiple language to any business owner. They're included in um, an on-site compliance visit that we provide to any business owner that requests it, and we'd be happy if helpful to partner with DOB and with the council to provide further outreach to business owners. Well, I appreciate you saying that. We are trying to get one in my district and we're having some scheduling issues. So <coughs> if we could follow up, I would love to bring you into the district. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I would like to circle back to uh, Council Member Drum's legislation, intro 465. Um, Keeping with the theme of outreach, I know that you said that uh, the Department of Human Rights or the Human Rights Commission has done some outreach. Um, I'm wondering uh, what outreach, if any, has the DOB already done regarding the gender neutral bathroom requirements? So specific to this requirement, beyond when the local law was enacted, where we put information in our building newsletter, um, issued a service notice to the industry, um, that's, that was the outreach that we performed. Okay, thank you. I think, um, I, I don't know if I neglected to mention that we have been joined by Richie Torres and now uh, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. You look like I, like I made a mistake that you were Richie, no. I, mean, I, knew, I knew it was you, I knew it was you. Does that, are there any more questions? I have a few more. Uh, intro 836, um, are there any budgetary implications for the Department of Buildings as a result of this bill? Yes, just give me one second. Sure. Uh, so um, the Department of Buildings would lose approximately $8 million in fees, and the, fi the fire department would um, see an increase in fees of about $2 million. I don't even know how to respond to that. With overall, overall savings for businesses of a, or applicants of about $5.5 million. So I certainly would keep my focus uh, there. Um, we know that uh, <laughs> these are not revenue generating uh, opportunities. So while I appreciate you giving me, that, giving me that number, um, it on, in, it's in the best interest of, I believe, obviously it's my bill. I believe in, uh, in, in the interest of small businesses. Uh, can you please describe the current 
procedure for approval processes for the system that would be affected by this legislation? Sure, so as I mentioned in my testimony, um, applicants will save about a month and a half overall between the processes. And the way it works is that we're talking about three different processes here. Um, and each process goes through, I'd say like four stages. First is filing where business owners um, submit their, their project specifications and all of the required documentation. The second is the plan review stage where um, it, the relevant department makes sure that the plan meets all of the applicable code requirements. Then there's actually the installation and construction stage where the business owner goes off um, and does the work with their contractors. And then finally, there is the final inspection and approval. So previously, both buyer and buildings interacted with the applicant for each of those different stages of the process. And now um, it will be buyer. So speaking of that, um, this, this question is for FDNY. It's a capacity question. Uh, do you believe that the FDNY has sufficient resources to carry out the functions that are currently carried out or performed by the Department of Buildings? Well, currently, uh, when the bill proposes to change the process. So the process will change. Uh, so the amount that's coming to the fire department today will remain the same. Uh, moving forward, we expect to increase processing. Uh, currently, we charge, you asked about price before, you know, uh, we currently char uh, charge $420, which is a flat rate. Um, DOB currently uh, accepts $165 in application fee. So the fire department will be assuming that $165 plus our $420 that we do. Um, we will have to gear up, you know, with the expectation of uh, increase in processing time. Like Rachel was saying, is that now, b b before uh, they went to DOB, now they come directly to the fire department and file the application. So we'll have to do a, a variety of activities in order to make sure, you know, to compensate for what DOB was doing before. But uh, we, ha we do have a plan. It has been discussed since 2015, like Rachel said. So we, we are uh, confident that we will be able to go online when ready to move over. So does the plan include increased manpower? Yes. Okay. And, and so that's, that's built, into, built into the plan is, is the cost? Well, we expect to, we know what the, the increase is going to be. We expect about, like, currently we have like 9,800 applications annually that we, we, we're going to process. We expect to increase that 15% annually every year moving forward. Um, we, 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 like I said, we do have a plan for it, you know, and it's going to involve uh, intake people, you know, uh, when the plan comes in, uh, extra processing. One of the things I'd like to add too, which, which we didn't bring up, is uh, regarding cost savings is that currently now what happens is that plans have to be filed by a licensed uh, design professional, which is either a registered architect or a licensed engineer. Um, for range hood, you know, range hood suppression systems, instead they'll have to be filed by a master fire suppression contractor, which, uh, who file the plans for the pre-engineered systems and the fire department will have to hire additional engineers to uh, review the plans to ensure they're in compliance with industry standards and, and codes. So this council's relationship um, with FDNY, I, I, I would like to think has, or cite as being a decent one. Um, what I don't, the, the reason I'm asking these questions is because what I don't want to happen is next year, you come back and say, we, we, we appreciated the law, but we didn't have enough to do it. And then, and then we're at an adversarial point with each other when this is the time when we could be negotiating whether or not the resources are available, whether or not the plan um, dictates uh, the allocation uh, of the appropriate resources. Um, I, I want our relationship to remain strong. I don't want to come back a year or two from now uh, saying that the, the, the law wasn't implemented appropriately and the, and the service did, never was rendered, and then your response is that, well, we, we, didn't, we, we didn't have enough capacity mm -hmm. to do it. Well, I, I agree with you. I think that's probably smart and that's efficient. And uh, as much as I like coming back here, I don't want to come back here again. I don't have to. I, I love you too. You but know? <laughs> but um, it's my understanding that, uh, that there's been a lot of discussions regarding that. And uh, I think we feel, the fire department feels confident that we're, you know, the plan that we have forward will be able to address our concerns going forward. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions for this panel, Oh, we've been joined by Council Member Perkins. Uh, if there are no more questions from this panel, we can uh, call the next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, 
Dolph Goldenberg, Catherine Cohen, Mateo Gutero Tavares, and Linda Nugent. I felt like saying no running. I'm a father of six. As soon as I saw it, I was like, no, no running. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's why I'm always looking stressed. <laughs> Can you uh, please just state your name uh, and begin your testimony? Um, we can start. On, we can start there. Generally, uh, my chivalry won't allow. For, for that to happen, and we usually allow for women to testify first, but. Good morning. Or Good morning. Not. Council Member Sorry. In support of introduction 465, which I'm, would I'm sorry, um, Dolph, can you can you just tell me what the acronym? Oh, just, Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. Thank you. Thank you. So, in support of introduction 465, which would amend the crucially important legislation enacted in 2016 as Local Law 79, TILDEF is committed to ending discrimination against transgender people including gender nonconforming and non-binary, and to achieving equality for our community through impact litigation and education. In furtherance of that goal, our then staff attorney, Ethan Rice, testified before this committee in favor of Local Law 79 in January 2016, and explained in great detail the necessity and importance of that legislation in making it possible for transgender New Yorkers to perform the most basic of functions using a bathroom without fear of harassment or the threat of violence. A copy of our previous testimony in support of Local Law 79 is submitted as an appendix. The enactment of Local Law 79 was a crucial step towards protecting the rights of transgender and gender nonconforming individuals to use single occupant restrooms, whether located in restaurants, stores, office buildings, or elsewhere in peace and safety. However, based on our own observations and reports by others, both general awareness of the new requirement on the part of owners of affected premises and compliance with those requirements have been minimal at best. Although Local Law 79 required by its terms that no later than 2017, all single occupant toilet rooms were to be made available for use by persons of any sex and were required to be designated Continuing, can I just ask, we only have two panels today, can we add one minute and make it three minutes? So um, let me just jump right to a couple of other things then. Um, in our opinion, the vast majority of New York City business owners and commercial landlords whose establishments still have male and female single, single occupant restrooms do not mean any harm and are not being malicious in failing to comply with Local Law 79. Most, we believe, are unaware of the new law and the practical effects that sex-specific single-occupant bathrooms can have for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. We also noted when we went to 311 online, there is no drop-down to actually report a restroom that is not in compliance with this law. We do believe that this is a critical, an absolutely critical amendment to this law, and we believe that it is one more step toward justice. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if anyone uh, is still here from Department of Buildings, uh, because they testified that um, they hadn't received any complaints. Oh, 
So they, they, they noted that they hadn't received any complaints on bathrooms and hadn't been triggered by that. And now we're finding that 311 doesn't allow for that, uh, that complaint to, to be made in that way. So I just want to make sure that that complaint. You can file a complaint through 311, so you're referring to 311 online, which does not include the University of Washington Medical Review Files. Well, we certainly need to adjust that, that as well, though. Okay, we can talk about that later. Chair Cornegan, at one time also, you could not do it on 311. It was only because of our intervention that now you can. And, um, and I'm not sure about the online versus the phone call business, but we need to find that out as well. So we will be following up with, with the, uh, I'm sure that Councilmember Drum will be following up and this, this committee will follow up as well. Thank you for that information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Cornegy, and thank you to the whole Housing and Buildings Committee for hearing, me test for hearing my testimony today. And thank you to Councilmember Drum for sponsoring Intro 465, which if passed would require the, building, the Department of Buildings to uh, conduct education and outreach programming, which support the trans and gender nonconforming what, people's I'm access. sorry, I just need you to identify yourself for the record. Sure, my name is Linda Nguyen, and I work for the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Um, and we serve New York's lesbian, gay, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities through direct services and advocacy. Um, so in my role, I support our outreach programs, our coalition work, and our policy initiatives, and I'm here to talk to the committee on how New York City can better serve its TGNC community through Intro 465. Um, in December 2015, the Office of the Mayor received guidance on, um, through the New York City Commission on Human Rights um, on how this bill, Intro 465, can help move us closer to fulfilling the needs and uh, protecting TGNC New Yorkers. Single occupancy bathrooms are necessary reinforcements of a basic human right. TGNC people are assaulted, face harassment, and encounter hostility for just using the restroom. In one instance, one of my colleagues was followed into the women's restroom. The pursuant proceeded to deny my colleagues access to the women's restroom, misgendered them, and proceeded to harass them while continuously banging on the bathroom cell door until they left. Hostile acts like these happen every day, even though New York City ensures that TGNC people receive the right to use bathrooms all over New York City. Sometimes building staff are bigoted, but most often they are unsure of the rights that our TGNC community members have in our city. Education outreach programming is one small step that will help reinforce the provision for single occupant bathrooms and protect New York City's TGNC community. Intro 465 offers the community the opportunity to live in a safer New York City and a place where no one has to question whether it's worth to use the restroom or whether it's safe enough to go to the restroom alone. New York City LGBTQ community deserves the opportunity to practice basic human rights and the provision to, of education and outreach programming is a necessary ask that needs to happen now. I respectfully ask the City Council to support Intro 465 to ensure New York City can become a safer place where LGBTQ communities and HIV-affected communities can thrive. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, incident that you cited with your colleague, was, yes. was that harassment perpetrated by an employee or a, just a regular or another patron? It was just another patron, okay. and we see this type of policing all the time for just using the bathroom. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Katherine Cohen and I'm a law fellow with Lambda Legal. I would like to thank the Committee on Housing and Buildings for the opportunity to testify today in support of Intro 465. Founded in 1973, Lambda Legal is the oldest and largest national legal organization whose mission is to achieve the full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people, and those living with HIV through impact litigation, education, and public policy work. I'm here today to urge you to enact Intro 465. This amendment would establish and implement an education and outreach program to increase awareness of Local Law 79. Increased awareness is known to increase compliance. Transgender and gender nonconforming people across the country report high levels of harassment. Physical violence, verbal and sexual assault, and workplace harassment are just some of the daily realities faced by members of our community whose gender expressions are met too often with hostility instead of understanding. 
In 2015, the National Center for Transgender Equality conducted the largest survey of trans people in the United States. The survey documented the consequences of our society's deeply rooted prejudices. It outlined the pervasive mistreatment and violence against trans and gender nonconforming people, as well as the systemic loss of opportunities that these people experience on a daily basis. Of the 2,715 residents, 1,779 were New York residents. Sorry, respondents and residents. Specifically with regard to restrooms, 11% of the New York respondents reported being verbally harassed when accessing a restroom in 2014. 58% of the New York respondents reported that they had avoided using a restroom out of fear in the previous year, and 28% reported that they limited the amount that they drank or ate to avoid having to use the restroom. These statistics are alarming. They confirm a reality in which our society's commitment to the gender binary has real life consequences. Of the national respondents, 40% reported attempting suicide in their lifetimes, almost nine times that the rest of the, the, rest of the US population. Providing access, accessible all gender restrooms is crucial for the safety of our community. Although, although the New York City Council acknowledged this need and the ease with which single occupancy restrooms could be marked for use by all genders, there remains a lack of compliance. A reason for this is the absence of an education and outreach provision in the original law. As a result, many people are simply unaware of the current law. The impact of having an access to an all gender restroom for a person who feels more comfortable in a non-gendered restroom is profound. According to a 2016 psychological study of transgender and gender nonconforming people, denial of access to restrooms had a significant relationship to suicide al suicidality, even after controlling for interpersonal victimization. Providing access to safe access to providing safe access to restrooms shifts this correlation away from suicide and helps the gen transgender and gender nonconforming people in their workplaces, public spaces, and everyday lives. Uh, for these reasons, I urge you to enact intro 465. Ms. Cohen, reading your testimony reminds me of how awesome law fellows are. The, your citing and footnoting gets me excited about the law. So I'll have to also thank my intern who helped me with that as well. Okay. This, this, this is actually awesome, so I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, good afternoon, uh, members of the Committee of Housing and Buildings. Uh, today I'm here to testify about the importance of requiring the Department of Buildings to conduct education and outreach regarding single occupant toilet room uh, requirements. My name is Mateo Guerrero, and I am the Popular Education Coordinator at Mechthero, New York. Um, I'm here today because I deeply believe that communities should be able to use a restroom without having to make a political statement. Um, and today I'm here not to talk about statistics, but to talk about my personal experience. So I am a transgender man, um, and ever, ever since I started identifying as Mateo, it was extremely difficult accessing uh, different public spaces, particularly public restrooms. Before starting my hormone replacement therapy, I was constantly being kicked out of the men's bathrooms, being called names while in the bathroom and even in the single occupant rooms uh, when the marker uh, was either gender I was being asked from people around me to leave the bathroom or even leave the premises um, or they will uh, threaten to call the manager to tell them that I was in the wrong bathroom. Um, then after I started using hormone replacement therapy uh, or called passing, which means people would read me as the gender I identify as, uh, the interactions in the bathrooms were no longer violent experiences, uh, but were concerns uh, regarding my health. And what I mean by that is that um, Men bathrooms are impossible to use as a trans person. For example, the Tumping Squares, uh, Square Park uh, bathroom, the male's bathroom has no doors. Um, and so what does that mean for me as a transgender person? That I can, yeah, go into the male's bathroom, but that means I cannot use that restroom, right? It is uh, a safety concern if I go into that restroom and I am um, sitting down with no door and a man comes in, that is a, a safety concern. And it's a health concern if I try to use the woman's bathroom, uh, but I will not be able to do so because of my gender presentation. Um, so, um, therefore, for the past two years, those have been my experiences with bathroom, not being able to use them because male restrooms don't have doors, uh, regardless of being a public or private space. This also happens at bars. I'm older than 21, by the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, last weekend, however, I did have 
uh, a really dehumanizing bathroom experience. Um, I, it was actually a single occupant restroom. Um, I was at a bar downtown with some friends and I tried to use the male's bathroom. Uh, so just, I'm gonna use a lot of wording here, but uh, the, ba the male's bathroom was all thrown up. So I could definitely not go in there. And um, I also don't have the abilities to stand up uh, while, uh, to pee while standing up. So I decided to go into the bathroom that was marked for women. Uh, there was a line, I was making the line to the restroom, it was a hole, and then one of the women started um, saying that I shouldn't be, shouldn't go into the woman's bathroom because I present as a man. Uh, I told her that I couldn't use the other restroom, that I really needed to pee, and that I am transgender. At that point, she started screaming at me about my fa fake men clothes, making unnecessary comments about my genitals, about my personal life. She said uh, that if I had brought a strap on into the bathroom, it was extremely dehumanizing and unnecessary. Um, and so I stayed because I really needed to pee. Uh, and so once the bathroom got <laughs> empty, I went into the bathroom and she had left. She came back uh, and she started knocking on the door and she started uh, like saying like really awful things very loudly. Uh, and she started saying like how I couldn't have it both ways. I was really nervous because she was really aggressive. Um, I have a video of her. Um, and, and this happened at a single occupant bathroom. Um, again, this is not like, multiple restrooms, this was a single occupant bathroom. And so uh, it is really important that we educate business owners and different places about the policy of single occupant restrooms to be gender neutral. Going to the bathroom shouldn't be a political statement. We should be free to pee at least. Um, and uh, New York City needs to be more proactive into ensuring the safety of trans people, not only as a single occupant rooms, but also increasing the educational materials to end physical and verbal transphobic aggression that happens in any bathrooms. And I don't have any of the testimony, but I wanna clarify that it, this is happening to me as a person who like passes, right? But like the, the impact that it has on folks who are gender non-conforming um, or who are like not quote unquote pa passing because the gender binaries, whatever, um, the impact is much more higher, right? So thank you for letting me testify. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Mateo. And I'm sorry for your experience this weekend and for what seems to be a pervasive uh, negative behavior and what you have to experience. So uh, thank you all for your testimony. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I just want to say thank you all for all of your work and for even recognizing privilege after you shared such a serious, intense story, and I want to thank you for that. And to let you know that I represent Tompkins Square Park and we're working on the bathroom issue because that's unacceptable. We've also been joined by Council Member Margaret Chin and uh, Council Member Drum has a statement. Just to share my experience too, you know, I, I have been to single stall bathrooms, single occupant bathrooms um, in restaurants that are labeled male and female. And uh, if somebody's in the male, I'll just go into the female because I know the law. I wrote it, right? And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and when I came out of one, I won't say the name of the restaurant in Jackson Heights, uh, you know, a woman approached me and said to me, yeah, I'm not supposed to be in there. That's just for the women, you know? So that attitude is pervasive and it's basically because of the signage. For me, it was for the signage because, you know, it had just been labeled all gender, it wouldn't have, she wouldn't have an, had an argument. But I do want to thank you all for coming in and for your testimony. Thank you. Also, wanna, I want to note we've been uh, joined by Council Member Mark Jonai as well. Thank you so much for your testimony. We're going to call the next panel. Chief Samseer, Lowell Hirschenber Hirschberger, Tavares, Julio Tavares, and Juan Diaz, oh, I'm sorry, Chandra Haran. So we call those individuals uh, with their translators as well. So anyone can begin, but please begin by identifying yourself first, for the record. I'd like to thank the committee for hearing our testimony today. Uh, my name is Lowell Hirschberger. I'm, I'm with um, Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. We're a community-based organization in East New York. 
um, that supports a local business association called Cypress Hills Business Partners, of whom uh, four of my colleagues are here today. The Fulton Street Commercial Corridor in Cypress Hills, East New York, and the hardworking small businesses on the shopping strip have been devastated over the past year by the New York City Department of Building's harsh enforcement actions. Without any warning or prior outreach and education, the DOB has levied outrageous fines on our merchants for their signs and awnings. For decades, these signs and awnings have been on Fulton Street without any complaints from residents or tickets from the city. This group of immigrant merchants works 24-7 and they are already battling displacement pressures. This is pushing them to the breaking point. Most of the merchants have already removed their signs and are now spending thousands of dollars to pay the fines while spending thousands more to hire architects and expediters to comply with DOB's overly complicated rules and regulations regarding signs and awnings. We support Councilmember Espinal for introducing this legislation and for fighting for fairness for these struggling small business owners. We encourage other council members in the administration to enact this bill which will provide much needed relief for small businesses in Cypress Hills, East New York and throughout New York City. Uh, thank you. The merchant organization that you represent, well, first of all, tell Michelle Nugamau, I said hello. Um, I'll do that. Um, but collectively, how many years would you say those merchants have had shops along Fulton Street? So these are not new merchants. These are Correct. These are we, we, we did a study recently, com uh, Community District Needs Assessment, um, and I don't have the numbers in my head, but I remember we had a range from 40 years to the present in terms of um, how long businesses have been in operation on our strip. Um, I think that was one thing that was surprising in the assessment is that um, uh, these are not all new businesses. We're talking about 10, 15, 20 year old businesses. Um, one of my colleagues here was has been open for what, 40 years? 40 years. Um, and, and prior to the fine that was assessed to him, there was no warning, there was no, and he's had so uh, that particular awning that you were fined for, how long have you had that awning? Over 20 years. About 20 years. So, so actually, I don't want to break up uh, the, the testimony portion of this, because sure. I can launch into this and I hear, <laughs> I, feel, I feel Raphael Espinal uh, uh, ready to go, chomping at the bit. But I'll, I'll let the testimony complete, and then we'll, we'll have some questions for you. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Councilman Espinal, for introducing this thing. And uh, you know, we have been going, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Mr. Chandra Haranhali, and I'm a pharmacist, and I have a pharmacy in Cypress Hills. I have been in business for about 40 years, and that has been my uh, bread and butter, and I have been working there for uh, uh, all the community uh, members and things like that. And as, uh, uh, Councilman Corge said, like, you know, I have been having that uh, sign for almost like about 20, 25 years, maybe more, I'm not sure. Um, but I never had any uh, violations. There was no, uh, they, they never gave me any uh, warning. Uh, they just gave me a ticket, and uh, the ticket was worth, I had to, uh, $5,000, and I had to clarify it. And to fix the whole, uh, it, it might cost me close to like about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars extra to put the awning on top of the awning what we have. And these kind of violations, uh, uh, it gives, a, like, you know, for a business like a small business like us, it's very hard for us to uh, deal with it. And we are trying to, especially nowadays, like, you know, the small businesses, we are having a hard time to manage ourselves to have our business going through. And uh, it is becoming very hard for us. Uh, actually, we are, uh, as the uh, uh, Espinal's, uh, Councilman Espinal's uh, uh, bill coming up, we want some time and they wa we want them to give us a warning. And uh, if the warning is there and we, are, we know we can correct it, but if the warning is not there and they give a fine automatically and they give a time of like, you know, within uh, 
30 days or 40 days we have to pay the fine, it becomes very, very hard for the small businesses to even come up with that kind of money. Um, uh, it's very hard and uh, I would appreciate like, you know, if this thing gets passed and uh, thank you very much for listening to my voice. Thank you for your testimony. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chief Samsayer. I am the owner of a Caribbean restaurant by the name of Roti on the Run on Fulton Street. Uh, last year, over a year ago. Uh, Chief, you didn't happen to bring any roti with you today. No, <laughs> I didn't know. I was going to meet you. Just asking. All right. But next time you come to see Michelle, you can stop by. Okay, no problem. <laughs> right. Um, correct, correct, yes, yes. Uh, a little over a year, uh, well, over a year ago, I was one of the 80 businesses that received the violation for the awning. Uh, no warning or such. Uh, my business is uh, located on the corner of Fulton and Norwood. Due to the violation, we suffered tremendous loss in business because there's no signage up there. Uh, people think the business is closed. The violation, the penalty was $5,000, plus there's a civil penalty. That's not including the cost to replace the sign and the permits, et cetera. Um, with warning, all of this could have been avoided and you know, keep us from losing tremendous amount of revenue over the past year. Uh, what I would like to see the Councilman Espinal bill pass because it will give the future businesses or the new businesses <coughs> education on how to go about uh, installing the sign the correct way or the businesses in different community that has not been issued a violation yet, they might have an opportunity to get the uh, warning, hey, we're gonna issue sign, your sign is not in compliance, so you have X amount of time to correct it and this would save a lot of money for us small businesses. And basically that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. Buenos días, mi, Julio, mi nombre es Julio Tavares. Represento Tavares Restaurant, 234 de Cleveland. Son negociantes como por 11 años. Eh, es importante para nosotros eh, respetar la ley de la ciudad. Pero también entiendo que el departamento de building um, se, ha, se ha excedido con, con, con la multa con, el, con nosotros. De, manera, de una manera agresiva en, la, en que los negocios de, de, con los negocios de nuestra comunidad. Hemos sido eh, tratados por el departamento de building. Yo recibí personalmente una multa de cinco mil dólares. Um, para también gastar de eso el dinero que hay que pagar para bajar el letrero viejo, el permiso, eh, remodelar eh, eh, un, un ONI nuevo. Eh, de una manera especial yo le pido a la ciudad de Nueva York que tome en cuenta en nuestro punto de vista y trabaje con nosotros. Muchísimas gracias. Good morning, my name is Julio Tavares. I, I am the proprietor of Tavares Trava Restaurant at 234 Cleveland. I have been the owner for um, the past 11 years. I understand it is important as a business for us to follow city law. However, I disagree with the way that DOB has done it. I think they have gone above and beyond with their fines and the way they've treated us in an aggressive manner. I received a fine for $5,000 um, and that is without including the cost of remodeling or acquiring the new awning. Um, this, of course, is, is excessive for us. It is, um, and for that reason, I would like to ask the city to work with us to avoid, for, uh, with, avoid us having to close our doors eventually. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Now, uh, uncharacteristically, is there one more? Is there one more? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Eh, buenos días. Mi nombre es Juan Díaz. Soy presidente de ABI Multiservice, que está localizado en el 2887 de Fulton Street. Eh, prácticamente yo he estado en esa localidad por 15 años aproximadamente. 
Ahora bien, yo tengo un negocio en el 2980 de Fulton. Ahí nos dieron un Somos. Eh, prácticamente, eh, lo, la parte importante es que da un poquito de brega entender eh, cómo resolver la situación del Somos, cómo corregir la situación. Es un poco intrigante porque no hay un, un, un proceso, de un, un protocolo a seguir en el cual se pueda definir correctamente cómo pagarlo. En el caso mío, se dio el somo ese día y después como a la semana llegó eh, la misma persona como con, un, con algo parecido, como que el primero no estaba, eh, no era eh, correcto. El caso es que tú llamas al departamento de building y también te dan el running around. O sea, eh, da un poco de mucha brega uno llegar a una conclusión cuando habla con alguien. Y prácticamente muchas veces la información es, es eh, conflictiva. Es decir que Todavía, si uno quiere pagar y resolver la situación, resulta un poco dificultoso. Esto prácticamente eh, yo lo considero como improcedente y verdaderamente no es que no querramos cooperar, pero prácticamente yo considero que deben de hacer las regulaciones eh, en la cual uno pueda proceder con más precisión a resolver la situación y no tenga un conflicto, o sea que se interprete en base al conocimiento de la persona, por lo menos. Prácticamente creo que eh, queremos un plan de entrenamiento, un plan, o sea, un plan por el cual se haga más fácil entender de qué se trata y así creo que todo el mundo estaremos eh, más contento y conforme. Muchas gracias. Uh, good morning, my name is Juan Diaz. I am the proprietor of AVI Multiservice on Fulton Street. I've been there for 15 years. I'm part of the uh, Cypress Hills Merchants Association as well. And I also have another business at 2980 Fulton. Uh, what I wanted to basically state to the committee is that uh, we want to resolve what uh, the whole issue is all about. We, but the issue, what we believe though, is highly complicated. You see, there's no protocol to follow on how to resolve the matter. For example, one week I had an inspector come in and talk to me about the subject, and then the, on the same week another one came by as if you know they, they weren't in conversation with, e with each other. They seem to, to kind of be saying different but similar things at the same time. Also, when you call DOV, you get what I call the runaround. Uh, they give you conflicting information uh, about how to resolve it. So even if you want to, even if you want to pay, even if you want to comply, uh, you're getting uh, different information all the time. And, it, and again, it's not like we don't want to comply. What we want, uh, what we're asking for is for a training program so that we're all aware of what the requirements are and in that way we will all be happier. Thank you. So uh, before we go to questions from my colleagues, um, I'm going to make a statement. Listen, as the former chair of the Committee on Small Business, we now have the current chair uh, here who's I'm sure going to address this, but um, what sits before me, uh, council member, is the rich diversity in businesses that our cities are made of. And I'm not willing to sit by and watch that destroyed. So to hear the different languages and the different businesses in one community is, is the richness that people come from all over the world to seek in New York City. And the idea that we could have a hand in it as a city and as city agencies and be responsible for the dismantling of that, I can't, I can't sit idly by and watch that happen. So for this to have, um, are all of these businesses in proximity to each other? So somebody kind of just did a blanket <laughs> sweep almost. So, so, so that's incredibly concerning. Yeah, the, the, um, the 80 fines that the council member referenced um, is, is now more like over 100, 110. Um, and it is all within, um, I don't know the exact distance, I'm gonna say about a mile and a half. Um, on one strip. So we've asked for uh, DOB to turn over to us those zip codes um, and I'm hoping that this disturbing trend that I'm feeling is anecdotal and not statistic because that would be uh, very, very, very concerning uh, to me. Yes. Yeah. Um, we are located uh, in Cypress Hills and our area was just rezoned. So I'm not I'm hoping it's not a conspiracy <laughs> with the violations that's issued in the rezoned area in Brooklyn. So uh, also uh, it was referenced by DOB that those um, have been generated by 311 complaints. 
I will also be following up to see if I could trace those complaints um, and to see if it was issued, if those calls are by one individual, because we can actually trace that to see where those calls, we've done that through SBS before to find out, we've had people who've made complaints, several complaints, and we find it's the same person. Um, that's very disturbing. So what we're going to do is find those zip codes. So we, we realize that it's, this is close in proximity, but I wonder if this is happening in other parts of the city. Uh, so I'm duly bound to, to do that investigation, but do an investigation on who generated those calls through 311 and if it's one particular entity or a group that, that's doing that, um, we, we're going to identify that. So I, I'd like to go to my colleagues for questions. Mark, in particular. Thank you, Chairman. This is a very sensitive issue to me, and I'm very sympathetic, and I'm feeling your pain uh, when it comes to this unfairness. Um, this is an outdated piece of legislation. It dates back to 1961. When we think of where we were as commercial corridors and small business owners uh, some 60 years ago, it is not practical to apply what was once probably sensible legislation to today's uh, fast-paced um, media, uh, eye-catching advertisements that are needed to promote our businesses so we can barely survive. Now, as small business chair, um, I truly appreciate your time here today and for this testimony, but I want you to know you're not alone. This is citywide. And I did not understand, and I can't understand why the city has not kept the moratorium in place until the rules governing signage are updated to modern times. Um, the challenges that you face day in and day out, from consumer behavior changes to the internet to challenges with the box stores and chain stores and the competition, government, at bare minimum, should be doing more to help you keep your doors open, not being used as a tool for punishing your success, uh, your investment, but actually appreciate the job creation, how your, com how your investment makes our communities a fantastic place to live, raise a family, and provide shopping opportunities locally. So I embrace each and every one of you, and chair and colleagues, uh, this is probably one of the, the most challenging issues today when it comes to small businesses. A $5,000 fine where, plus civic, uh, civil penalties, which, well, would, replace the awning. which mandates immediate removal of the awning until a licensed architect can properly file, to have that work then bid is, could be weeks to months in a very competitive environment and challenges for these small business owners. I, I would hope that we could embrace this notion of a moratorium be in place until we can address this serious issue and show our small business owners out there and these mom and pop shops that government is a good partner and we appreciate their sacrifices and their initiatives. Um, and I encourage all of you to help Espinal uh, and as a body that we push, we make this a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, any more questions or comments? No, I just want to say I feel very encouraged to hear the support of my colleagues, especially our Chair Cornegy, who uh, understands the, the, the struggles that small businesses go through. Uh, we're going to continue pushing forward. I'm glad to see the community here uh, standing side by side to make this possible. Let's just make sure we continue working together. Uh, just one note, I know we, we talked about the best roti in Brooklyn. Let's talk about the best rice and beans. In Brooklyn, it's Tavares. <laughs> so you can visit him as well in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And you can be assured that um, in partnership with uh, your council member, Espinal, we'll get to, to, to some resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Uh, this uh, this hearing uh, is officially closed.